to us from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, beginning at verse 19. Listen for the word of God. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced with they saw that it was the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And through, and through believing, you may ha have life in his name. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I particularly enjoyed the last part of that scripture where he says to Thomas, have you believed because you've seen and blessed are those who believe even though they don't see. And he says that all these things were written down so that you might believe and that there were many other things that were done, but these stories, even though they do not include all of what Jesus did in his life, are enough for faith and belief. And that those are words, I think, that are written for us, words that are written for us who are never able to see and to believe, but have faith and trust in our believing. Having such faith is one of the hard things for us in our lives sometimes. Believing where we have not yet seen. Thomas has that kind of struggle. And I remember, it was interesting that, um, that years ago when I was serving as the pastor at, at Wesley, I, there was a young woman who was a part of the congregation. She was a student at OCU, religion major. She went on to Harvard Divinity School. But, but we were, had a, a relationship where I was kind of a mentor to her. And I remember one day, very clearly, she came into my office and she was having a lot of struggle with her faith, doubt. I knew her, I knew her background, I knew she came from a solid church and, and a place where she had, uh, had grown in her maturity. Uh, so much going for her in her life. And, but her faith was becoming more difficult because life was asking a different set of questions than the questions that she had grown up. With. And, and that caused her to ask different questions of, of faith and of, of God. And in going through that time, uh, it, she went through some doubts and some struggles. And so we met together to talk about it. And it was interesting that as I prepared this message, kind of thinking of her this week, um, Joe came in this morning and she said, well, I was cleaning out my parents' house and guess what I found? And she brought this brochure of uh, back whenever... We were students at OCU, and if you look at the picture, on one end of it is Joe, and she's there, and then there are a number of other religion majors, and then on the other end of it was me, you know, and so we were all kind of there together, and, and, and it, it kind of just brought it full circle, because I remember so clearly those times 
uh, in, in college and, and raise questions of, of my own faith and push me to help find more mature answers to deal with a more mature life. And as I read the scripture about Thomas, I think about the ways in which in our own lives there come times which we doubt, which we have questions in our faith. And Thomas has a doubt that is, if you will, an intellectual doubt. It's an empirical doubt. He wants to see, to touch. He might well have been from Missouri, right? Show me. He wants to, to see it. And he can only have faith if he can see it. Prove it to me. Now, we, rem we should remember about Thomas. Thomas, whenever others were ready to, uh, to call Jesus back, he said, let us go and die with him. He was ready to lay his life on the line with Jesus. But he needed something more in his faith. It wasn't about his devotion. He just needed a deeper sense of, 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 of being able to, to see and to touch. And so Jesus, when he comes, he says, see, touch. It's what he needs for his own sense of faith. We have all kinds of questions in our mind. How do we put it together? Sometimes those questions can lead us to a deeper sense of, of doubt. But we should always remember that our intellect is a gift to us from God, that God intends for us to use and to employ in our faith. So it's not just a matter of, of being anti-intellectual. God wants us to be absolutely intellectual and to use the gift of reason as a part of putting our faith together. You might remember just uh, days before this, whenever Mary sees Jesus. And when Mary sees Jesus after the tomb, she holds to him. And Jesus says, do not cling to me. And in that moment, you can see that Mary has a sense of doubt, but it's a different kind of doubt. For Mary, it's not an empirical doubt. It's an emotional doubt. She loved and devoted and gave her life to Jesus, and he died and was gone. And now he's back, and she does not want to let go. She wants to hold him so that he can never leave again, maybe. Hers is an emotional doubt. We can doubt in a lot of different ways. That's where her faith had led to. So when the young student came to meet with me and to talk about some of the doubts she was having in faith, we, we, one of the things we did was we opened up scripture and we said, you're not the first one to have had doubts. When the, in the Bible, you can find people, people of faith, great examples of faith, who sometimes doubted and wondered. One of the things that I think was a, a beautiful gift that Mother Teresa left for us. You know, she devoted her, her life to helping the poor in Calcutta. And she, she was not always a warm, fuzzy person. We have those kind of images of her. She was a tough, tough lady because she dealt with a lot. But one of the things she did was she left for us uh, in her own journaling uh, a book that was published and in that, she talks about how often in her life she had doubts and had struggles. You might think, how in the world could she have done what she did if she had doubts and struggles? But the truth is, the opposite of doubt is not faith. But the opposite of doubt is, or the opposite of faith is really fear. Fear, doubt plays a role within faith. Faith and doubt work together. Faith, doubt is the, the thing that causes us to question and push deeper in our lives. Fear is the thing that causes us to retreat. And so we opened up the scriptures and we looked at Thomas. We looked at Mary. So the young woman and I looked through different scriptures where people had doubts and questions and that she should know that that's really okay. It's a part of our journey, not something to be rejected, but to be embraced so that we can push toward deeper answers. Maybe in your life you've had such doubts. Maybe they've caused you to want to pull within or to maybe say, I don't know that I can believe any of that. And so maybe we've been tempted to just walk away. But the truth is, through our doubting, 
we can find ways to push to deeper answers in our faith. As we talked, I said, let's go downstairs. And so we walked from where my office was upstairs. We walked down to the church library. And I showed her some of those places where there were books like Mother Teresa's, where there were people who had wrestled with the questions of faith and had come to deeper answers. She was one who was well acquainted with the library, though. So she knew the questions that people raised and knew how they had been able to find answers in their lives. And so she pushed deeper still. One of the things about fear is that fear can hold us back, can hold us back from being all that we are really created and intended to be. In your bulletins, there was an insert that had uh, 10 self-descriptions of happy and healthy people. I think that's a, an amazing list. It was one that was collected by, in her research by Gail Sheehy. Uh, she wrote the book on passages about how we have different kind of passages in our lives that we move through. And I found this to be really helpful. The first one, she said, or going from 10 down to nine, is that people who are happy and healthy in life say, I have no strong fears. I have no strong fears in my life. There's nothing in my life that truly causes me to be fearful and scared in life. That fear is the opposite of faith. So these are people who are living with a great sense of faith in life. Think about the disciples. Jesus has been crucified and resurrected, and it says that they were gathered together with their door shut for fear, for fear. They were afraid, so the door was shut and locked. And then think about what happened to them in their lives. Men who, those disciples, were, were ambassadors of faith around the world, traveling to places as far away as India, they tell us, that Thomas eventually went to as a missionary, traveling all around the world. It's an amazing thing to remember those people who had the door shut and closed became those who carried the faith around the world. Number nine, I'm not thin-skinned or hypersensitive to criticism. I wish I could say that more truly of myself. I uh, tend to take criticism a little more personally than I'd like. But, um, but, but you know, what, these are folks that know in life that uh, you're able to make it through, that they're, uh, just, they're on their journey, uh, that I am a cheerful person. People who are happy and, and have a, a great sense of well-being are people who are, are cheerful. They've not been made cynical by doubt, not been made cynical by fear, but they're people who have a strength of inner strength. They've learned to love and be loved in life to be able to risk offering yourself that vulnerability into another person's care. In doing that, you risk the, the, the fear of rejection. You risk so much opening your life to another person. And in doing so, we're able to come to a place of deeper understanding of ourselves, to love and be loved. The extent of my personal growth and development pleases me was number five. That each of us are people who are on a journey and growing. And we look at the disciples, at where they came from and to where they were going. There's so much yet ahead of them that they are growing toward. I have already achieved several long-term goals that I deem important. I think that's important in our lives that we have a sense of accomplishment as we're moving through. I rarely feel cheated and disappointed by life or others. People who live in the place of cynicism or fear often feel cheated. But when we are truly happy in life, it doesn't mean we haven't been. Goodness, people have taken advantage of us over and over again from time to time. But, but it means that we haven't been made jaded by that. We rarely feel cheated or disappointed in life. And I've undergone one or more important transition in my adult years and have handled it in a way that was unusual, personal, or creative. How many of us have not done that? Most of us have had some great difficulty in our adult years, maybe the loss of someone, maybe the loss of a relationship, 
maybe uh, the struggle with uh, parenting and, and, and that we've gone through a time of transition and have found ways to do that in a health, healthy and happy manner. Maybe you're in the midst of that place and you wonder, I don't think I'll ever get to the other side of that. Know and trust that if you have God as your partner in your life and you're working on that, you'll make the transition. You will get there to the other side. And then the last, my life is meaningful and has direction. We can be happy and healthy and full when we know that we are a child of God and that God is directing our life, and there's a purpose and a mission. And even if, you know, in the example we had of that video before, even if you work construction with your hands, he's able to do that in a way that he sees that he has a mission and a purpose in his life. Each of us need to be able to do that, to find in our place, our setting of work and life, that we are able to find God connecting to us and us being open to others, moving through life without fear and being able to embrace the doubt. Whenever Jesus uh, speaks to Thomas, he says, touch, reach out, see, touch. It is the answer to his empirical doubt. And when he does, he's touching his woundedness, right? It's in touching his scars. And what I think is quite remarkable is that in touching Jesus's st woundedness, maybe in a way we're touching our own, touching the place that is broken within us. Sometimes our wounds can only be healed when they're open and exposed and being able to be shared vulnerably with others. Have you ever had that experience where a person has opened up and shared about some brokenness they've experienced in life, and you knew they know what I'm feeling. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's saying, see, I know what pain and struggle is. I know the difficulties that you have faced. And maybe you've been on the other side of that, afraid to tell anyone about a wound that you hold within, but when you opened up and talked about it, you realized that by doing so, you were made more whole through the experience and you were able to reach out in a way that someone else was able to connect. In our reunion group, um, that's part of what we do is talk about the places where we're struggling in our faith, where there's woundedness in our own life. And I remember very clearly uh, a time when I was sharing pretty personally, maybe more personally than uh, I usually let, let go, and in doing so, uh, one of the guys afterward, he said, I'm so glad you said that because it let me know that maybe I can make it through to the other side because I've struggled with the same thing. In our lives, we need that. If we all pretended like we all had it together, which often we, we, you know, we're trying to, maybe that's one way we, we try to make it is we, we try to make ourselves look like we really got it together and we show up here. But if you knew the truth, if you knew the truth, everyone sitting around you is bearing some wounds in their life, some pain. And whenever we get past the point of thinking we gotta have it all together in order to be here, then we can realize that in being here and opening up the scars, the woundedness of our lives, God is able to transform us and our relationships so that we can be healed and others can be healed in life. We remember that Thomas was willing to go to the end with Jesus. In touching his woundedness, he was touching his own. We also need to learn the lessons about letting go and holding on. There are things in our lives we gotta decide that we're gonna either let go of or we're gonna hold on to. Sometimes we hold on to the exact opposite things that we need to hold on to. They're the very things we need to be able to let go of. A pain, a brokenness, something that has happened in our lives and we hold it as that place of uh, kind of, of a secret bitterness almost that, that we can go to and there's something kind of pleasing to revisit some of those pains, but they need to really be let go so that we can move on 
in our lives. Sometimes we have to let go. Jesus says to Mary, don't cling to me. Needs to be able to enter into a new kind of relationship with Jesus. One that's not dependent upon his being there every moment, but one that is able to know and to trust in a relationship that she has with him in her heart. Do not hold me. Do not cling to me. Being able to be set free, to let go, lets us hold on to the things that are most essential in our lives. Reaching out, I almost want us to kind of reach out and to take hands with one another. I'm not asking you to do that, but just think about the person who's beside you. To think about their own place in their life that, that maybe they're holding something that they need to, to be able to share, to let go of. It's in doing so that we're able to hold on in faith and hold on to that which is most valuable for us. We went through kind of some of the stories, the young student and myself, and I think it's in that moment we decided that she was gonna be able to make it. And so we took hands, we held hands, held our own brokenness and we prayed together. It's one of the places we need to be able to share ourself more, most fully is in prayer with God, with each other, and so we prayed. We learned that there are other folks who've had such doubts and questions in our lives, and yet when we trust and we know that God is present, we can make it through to the other side. George Matheson decided to go into the ministry. He was a student at Edinburgh, and he, he got to a place where he had so many questions. He decided he wanted to resign his church membership. So he went to talk to the priest and he went and said, I, I need to turn in my church membership because I just don't know that I believe all this anymore. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. We have a hymn in our hymnal that was written by George Matheson. It, it's titled, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. It's an amazing hymn because it says that that even when I was at a place of doubt, even when I was ready to let go of this, God was not letting go of me. And in our lives, even when we get to that place of despair, we need to know that we are still not alone because God believes in us even when we're not sure we believe in God. God is there. God is the one who holds us and will not let us go. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my soul in thee, he writes. Maybe this morning, you need to hear that word, that God is not letting go of you. And in doing so, you can trust, and you can live in that place of grace and faith until you make it to the other side. Amen.